Hello and welcome to the week 5 lecture for FINA H111 offered by Indiana University, Purdue University of Fort Wayne. Uh, this is History of Art 1, Prehistory to Medieval. And this week, week 5, uh, we'll be covering the art of ancient Greece. There's a whole lot to cover here, so let's not waste time and jump right in to the early Greek civilization. As just a quick overview of where we are uh, geographically, you'll notice in the right-hand portion of this map, the Aegean Sea and the Aegean Islands, which is what we were looking at last week. We're going to be moving over into mainland Greece, uh, and all of the areas of influence on mainland Greece will discuss just very briefly uh, a little bit of the Greek influence and spread of culture across the Mediterranean. Um, but what we're going to notice is how early Greek culture developed from those Aegean forebearers that we talked about last week, how they take root, develop, and change uh, into what we consider classical Greek culture today. Greek culture, ancient Greek culture, is divided into several periods, several chronological periods. The two early of, earliest of which that we'll be looking at this week are the geometric and orientalizing. Um, and you can look in your book and find a timeline of when these dates begin and end. Uh, I won't go over all of those dates here. Uh, we do know that there were Greek-speaking people in mainland Greece uh, in about 2000 BCE. Obviously there were people there before then, we know that. Uh, peoples who had come from various different regions and inhabited this area. Uh, we can document that there are people speaking an ancient form of Greek, uh, uh, recognizable as Greek, uh, as early as about 2000 BCE. Um, <clears throat> we know that uh, ancient Greece was organized into many different city-states, uh, it is incorrect to think about ancient Greece as a uh, as an empire or a unified kingdom. They really weren't. Each individual city-state was more or less autonomous. Uh, they all had their own uh, defenses, their own armies, their own economies, although they did network together and work together quite often, uh, especially if they felt like they were being invaded from the outside. They would unify their forces. Uh, they did all see themselves as fellow Greeks, uh, however, most often we see that there was a great deal of loyalty to one city-state. Um, so if you were from Athens, for example, you were an Athenian first and a Greek second. Um, and that might put you in conflict from somebody from Corinth or somebody from Sparta. Uh, you would all unify as Greek people. Uh, if you felt like you were being threatened from the outside, like with the Persians, for example. But anyway, let's take a look at these two pieces. They get a set idea of the foundations of classical Greek culture. Uh, before we get to the classic era, let's look at this image on the left, this geometric crater. Uh, and also on the right, this Corinthian uh, black figure amphora, which is a, an example of our orientalizing phase. Uh, so our geometric vase on the left uh, shows us a depiction of a funeral scene. And we're going to see very abstracted, uh, sort of geometrically abstracted figures of people and animals in a clear narrative sequence. And you see the whole thing uh, unrolling before you, uh, the entire narrative sequence of a funeral procession. Uh, the figures are very, very abstract, very, very stylized. Uh, and there's also a great deal of decorative motifs in there to tie it together. Organized quite rationally on registers. Uh, so they can be easily read and easily understood. As we compare that to the right-hand side, uh, this is an example of our orientalizing style, where in this particular example we see many animal figures and some plant figures, as well as some decorative motifs. Uh, this particular vase is polychromatic, so it has more than one, uh, more than one color on it. Uh, and we're, we're going to notice in this piece that's quite striking is this use of decoration and 
all of the negative space. There's almost no blank space in between these animals. The artist felt compelled to fill every nook and cranny with some kind of visual representation. That's going to be something that we'll see in this orientalizing period. Uh, that's a bit of an odd name, you, you're probably thinking. Why is it called the orientalizing? Uh, we do know that around about the years 725 to about 650 BCE, uh, we have an influx of a great deal of Near Eastern and Egyptian influences coming into mainland Greece. We'll see uh, a large immigrations of people, also expanded trade, uh, and just increased cultural communication between the Greeks uh, and these other civilizations. Once we get those cultural influences coming into mainland Greece, the Greeks pick up on it and start to absorb it into their own artwork. And something that you should notice during the course of this lecture and then over the course of reading the chapter in your book is how flexible Greek art is. Modern people tend to just think of Greek art and we think about classical Greek sculptures or classical Greek architecture. Um, and that's usually the first thing that comes to mind with most people. And while that's usually regarded as the peak of ancient Greek production, the, some of the most important if you want to say it that way, uh, as we'll see, Greek art is very, very flexible. It's very fluid. It changes a lot. It's a very dynamic culture that evolves and changes in radical ways. And compare the stylistic variation in ancient Greece to the stylistic variation that we saw in ancient Egypt. These are two very distinctly different cultures. And we can see that in how their artwork uh, changes and evolves or doesn't change over the period of centuries that they have influence in this part of the world. It's a very interesting connection. Uh, and talking about that Egyptian connection, we'll start to see a little bit of that in our next stylistic period, the Archaic. So as we move into the Archaic, period, stylistic period. Uh, we'll take a look at a few statues and then some architecture. We'll start with this statue here. Uh, this is typically refer referred to as a kore, uh, K-O-R-E. Uh, she was constructed sometime in the neighborhood of about 650 BCE. You can see she's carved out of limestone. Not a very large piece, uh, you know, just over two feet tall. Um, as we look at her, we'll notice that she is highly stylized, but she's very, very abstract, very, very rigid. And I would encourage you to try to think back and connect this piece to what we've already seen in the ancient Near East and in Egypt, because you're going to see a lot of similarities here um, in how the body has been geometrically abstracted and the abstraction of the facial features, especially the eyes. Uh, the patterning of the hair, uh, the, the arrangement of the clothing, there's going to be a lot of similarity here. Um, so what, we'll see, what we're seeing here is a sculpture of a young woman, uh, and that's why it's referred to as a kore. I'll show you the male version of this in a second. Uh, this is very typical of our archaic period. We're going to notice that she is abstracted that she has a, a certain stiffness and rigidity to her pose. She's not standing in any sort of naturalistic or realistic fashion. Um, we believe that artists are being very much influenced by Egypt in the ancient Near East uh, and all of those cultures that we've looked at in this class before. The, the, the Greeks are aware of this and they're building on it and they're learning from it. I do want to call your attention to her face. Obviously the statue has been damaged over the centuries, uh, but the portion of the face that we do see, uh, we can see highly stylized eyes that are open. You can see a, a pretty uh, stylized face and her smile. She has a mouth with just the barest uh, essence of a smile there. Uh, and I'll come back to this idea of we call this the archaic smile and we'll try to discuss its importance here uh, in the next slide. So the last image we looked at was a kore. This is a koros. Uh, this is the male version of this freestanding statue. 
Now this one is considerably larger. It's over six feet tall and it's carved out of marble. Uh, so those things say something uh, significant about the piece. But let's look at it stylistically and let's notice a few things here. Um, we could easily compare this piece to the pieces of, um, of pharaonic art that we saw last week uh, with ancient Egypt. You'll notice that there's a similarity in the rigidity of the pose that we saw in some of the pharaoh pieces. Uh, that striding forward where one foot is in front of the other, we saw that in pharaoh pieces. Uh, the stylized sort of perfect body, perfect musculature that's highly idealized, all of that we see here. Uh, and something that we noticed in art of the ancient Near East, these eyes, that stylized hair. Um, we're seeing all of these very uh, striking similarities. Now where Greek culture will begin to differ from many of the ancient Near Eastern traditions we looked at and some of the Egyptian traditions we looked at uh, will be how they, as they develop and expand culturally and socially, how they'll begin to take these ideas that they're learning from other cultures and advance them in a very particular way, um, all in service of their particular religious beliefs. Um, so keep this image in mind. Take a good look at our Koros here. Because uh, I want to compare him to another very similar piece. Uh, and it's going to tell us something really important about this development of style in the Archaic period. This figure is also a Kuros. Uh, he's a, a youthful male figure. Uh, we have a name associated with this one, Kroisos. And he's dated to about 530 BCE, which isn't too terribly far away from the last one we saw. Um, this one is even bigger yet. He's about six foot four, so quite a substantial piece. Also carved out of marble. And I'm hoping as you look at this, you're noticing some striking differences to the previous one I showed you. Uh, where in this one, you can see, especially in the torso, uh, a great deal more interest in realistic representation of the body, increased musculature. As we look at the arms and the legs, there's a lot of attention being played to actually making this look like skin that is covering muscle, which is on bone. Uh, all of these attempts at really using observation of real human bodies and trying to mimic that in stone. And that's what is eventually going to set the Greeks apart from these other cultures and give them something that's extremely distinctive to mainland Greece. Uh, this interest in a sort of perfect beauty in the human body. Uh, now there are still sociological and political uh, implications and messages being portrayed in these, uh, but we're going to see it pay off in a very different way as the style evolves. As we look at Kroisos and you pay a special attention to his face, you'll notice that he still has that little odd smile. His face is still very stylized. And from the neck up, he really doesn't look very realistic at all. Um, that's still looking very static and kind of, for lack of a better term, very fake artificial looking. That little smile there is going to be important to, to try to find and pick out for us. That's often referred to as the archaic smile because we see it on almost all archaic pieces, all archaic uh, statues of this nature, Kore and Koros. Um, we believe it has something to do with wanting to show uh, this person being represented uh, as being alive, being full of a life spirit, being vital, which is why we also see this male here is striding forward. It's this idea of movement and being alive. Uh, these large uh, kuros, these large male figures, would have been used in and around uh, graveyards. They were essentially grave markers uh, meant to memorialize the young men buried here. Um, so we see these figures, they're youthful, they're strong, uh, they're full of vitality, they have the smile, they have the stride to try to give us a sense of what they were in life, their lifefulness. Um, these are, these large sort of grave marking figures are pretty much exclusively male. 
Um, and any of these that I've shown you, that previous one, this one, that are over six feet tall, pretty much going to be exclusively male until a little bit later on when we start to see some goddesses, uh, some figures actually from mythology being presented. But that's something else to notice on here with Croesus. Croesus here is not a god. This is not, he's not a god, he's not a king, uh, he's not a part of mythology. Uh, he was an everyday man. He was, he was just a mortal man who uh, was a part of a family and, you know, all of those very normal things. Um, and I want to point that out because that's a very interesting and unique sort of um, uh, religious position that the ancient Greeks are in. And I'll expand on that a little bit more when we start looking at representations of the gods and goddesses. Uh, but I do think it's important to, to realize that this very exquisite statue, six foot four of marble, uh, carved with all of this great detail. Uh, and this man was not a king, was, is not a god. Um, this is showing a different attitude towards representation uh, that we just haven't seen in some other cultures yet. I'll show you another archaic female figure here, another kore. Uh, this is the peplos kore. Peplos, by the way, refers to the garment she's wearing, the, uh, the cloak that she's wearing. Uh, this is from the Acropolis in Athens, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, she's only about four foot high, and these kore tend to not be associated with, with graves and commemoration, like the koros that we saw before. Uh, the kore very often seem to be associated with temples, uh, and temple architecture. Uh, as we look at this Kore, we'll notice that um, her left arm, it's on our right as we look at it, it seems to be broken off. Now what we think was going on here, that arm was, was coming away from her body at a 90 degree angle. If you can imagine that her arm had an elbow there and it was bent straight out from the elbow towards us. We think that she was holding a, uh, a lantern. She was holding something there like a light source that would have illuminated the uh, uh, where she was. Um, but you can see that her function then is primarily architectural decorative. This isn't necessarily a specific woman or a specific uh, identity that we can attribute to her. Um, she does have the archaic smile. Her eyes and face are very stylized in a very similar fashion. But like the previous Kore we saw, she is clothed. Her body is completely covered. For the most part, um, we will see uh, a lot of nudity when it comes to the male form and not quite as much nudity when it comes to the female form. Uh, there will be representations of nude female figures, especially when we get to the, uh, the goddess Aphrodite. Um, but for the most part, nudity is reserved for the male form. And there is a reason for that. There's actually a really important religious reason for that that I'll try to get to uh, a little bit later on. Uh, but first, let's take a look at some archaic architecture. It's during this era that the ancient Greeks start building on a monumental scale. Uh, that they really start putting together the engineering and the mathematics to understand how to construct on a much, much larger scale than they had previously. Uh, we do know that they're learning a lot of this information from the Egyptians. So, as you recall, the Egyptians already had some pretty massive building uh, projects underway uh, long before this point. This Temple of Hera comes from about 550 BCE. Uh, we do know that, as I've mentioned before, uh, the Greeks and the Egyptians have a lot of contact with each other. They're doing a lot of trade. They're participating in the same conflicts. Uh, so they are learning from each other. And we actually have documented evidence uh, that the Greeks are learning a lot of their engineering and construction techniques from the, from the Egyptians. So that's important. Uh, the Greeks are taking this knowledge, and they're not just transplanting it to their land. They're marrying it to their own cultural beliefs, their own religious ideals, uh, and creating unique forms of architecture based on it. So the Temple of Hera here is what we call a basilican plan. Uh, this is actually located in Italy. 
And we'll be jumping around the Mediterranean with our examples here, but it is important to note that although most of what we're considering comes from mainland Greece, uh, there were Greek temples in Italy. There were Greek temples up north of mainland Greece. Um, they had a pretty wide sphere of influence, to be certain. Um, this is what we call a Doric-style temple. There are different orders of Greek architecture. The Doric is the oldest of them. Uh, and this is an excellent example. So we'll notice that we have a large colonnade that wraps around the perimeter of the building. You'll notice that all of that is on top of these three steps. So we have the stylobate and the stereobate. In your, your book should be able to uh, point out what all of the uh, parts of architecture are. I'm not going to try to diagram it on a slide. That's just going to take too long. Uh, but the columns terminate in a capital, um, which holds up the frieze. And obviously, in our picture here, the roof has long since collapsed. But there would have been a triangular-shaped pediment on either end. Uh, with a sloping roof uh, to help shed off the the, uh, the elements. Inside of this colonnade would have been a separate structure, a building, the Sela, uh, where our cult statue and some more items would have been. Uh, so a very impressive piece of architecture. What we're going to notice about many of these temples with their colonnades is that they have a certain sense of sameness. What I mean by that is whether you approach it from one angle or another angle, it's very, very unified. Um, it has very much a, a continuous look to it. And there's some very clever architectural things that the Greeks are doing with these large-scale structures. Uh, your book will talk a little bit about entasis, where we swell out the columns in the middle just a bit uh, in order to, to give the optical illusion that they're straight. Uh, and in these temples and in the more classic temples, uh, what looks like a nice solid row of absolutely straight uh, vertical columns, they're actually tilted and they have entasis and they're on bowed grounds. Very clever optical things that the, uh, that the Greeks are doing to create that illusion of regularity and continuity. Um, I'll let you pick up on that in your book, which can, can explain it uh, a bit more technically than I can. Let's take a quick look at a floor plan of what this once looked like. Here's a floor plan of the Temple of Hera that we just looked at. So here we can see those parts I was talking about. The colonnade moves all the way around the perimeter uh, of the foundation. Uh, under the roof that would have been supported by that is the cella uh, or the naos. The entrance into the temple proper was through the pro naos, which we see on the right hand side, which also had some columns. We know that the Temple of Hera here had a series of columns inside the Sela that you see here, and then there was a back area, an interior uh, to it. This most likely had a what we call a cult statue inside dedicated to Hera. Um, so the statue would have been the focus of worship and the focus of honoring the goddess Hera. Um, and we'll see some examples of this in some other temples uh, an, a little bit later on. Another form of art that the ancient Greeks were particularly uh, good at and left us many examples of uh, was pottery and vase decoration. So here are two different archaic examples um, of what we mean by that. Uh, so this is from the Francois vase, which is what we call it now. Uh, we see a close-up and then we see the overall vase. This is still in what we call the archaic style. Now you'll notice some similarities to the geometric style that we saw earlier. The figures are very abstract, they're very flat, uh, they're organized in registers, and in this case we do have a clear narrative. Uh, here we have the Battle of the Centaurs uh, being spelled out for us here. And in the close-up on the right-hand side, you can see one of our warriors battling the centaurs. Now, this is a, a pretty famous story from Greek mythology. Um, and I won't go into all the details here. But I will point out that we have this warrior battling the centaurs. And we'll notice that there are these words written in Greek on the vase. 
uh, those words are the names of the people involved, the names of the centaurs, the names of the warriors, their location names. Uh, so it's very much trying to spell out and locate the story within mythology. Now that's pretty significant because when we bother to put writing onto a, a vase, onto some work of art like this, we're going to assume that the audience for it has the ability to read it. Uh, if we assume that most of the culture is illiterate, then there's really no reason to put text all over it. Um, so this is telling us something perhaps about the uh, the Greek concept of literacy and how much uh, how important it is to this culture that it's integrated into works of art like this. Now this isn't a tiny little vase; it's uh, over two feet high, so it's a pretty substantial uh, piece of pottery here. Um, and we're going to notice in these figures, they are very flat, they are very abstract, but there's lots of movement going on within the registers. Uh, and I really love the way you get the sense of these characters are fighting with each other, they're running, they're jumping. Uh, there's a whole lot of action and movement going on in this piece. Um, so we'll keep this sort of action in mind uh, as we compare it to another archaic example in the next slide. This is also an archaic piece. Uh, it's a black figure amphora. So an amphora just refers to the shape of the vessel. Black figure to the type of decoration we see where the figures are painted in black uh, on the, uh, the surface of the pot, uh, which in this case, the frieze is left red, which is the color of the terracotta. Uh, we actually have the artist's name uh, which is something, again, kind of unique to the Greeks, where we actually have them recording artist names. So Ezekias gives us this, and this is Achilles and Ajax playing dice, or playing draughts, as it's sometimes called. The entire vessel is about two feet high, so the frieze that we're looking at is a bit smaller than that. And I don't mind telling you guys, this is probably my favorite ancient Greek work of art. Uh, and there are a couple of different reasons why. One is just the immensely beautiful craftsmanship that goes into this. This is really breathtaking how skillfully Ezekias has composed this scene. The amount of detail that he has managed to put into this with these beautiful curvilinear lines um, and the decoration, the, the beautiful floral and geometric patterns on the cloaks that the men are wearing, uh, the texture of the hair, uh, it's, it's just everything works uh, and we see that it's still very very flat it's still very stylistic uh, abstracted in how it's presented uh, but it's absolutely just skillful and and eloquent in the way that he tells this story and the other reason this is this is probably my favorite piece uh, is because of the story being told here and I've mentioned this a little while ago about the relationship of the Greeks to their heroes and to their gods is a little bit different than some of the other ancient religions we've been looking at. Uh, and this is a great example of what we mean. So this is Achilles, he's on the left, and Ajax, he's on the right. Now these two men are not gods. They're not a part of the, the pantheon. Uh, but they are, however, probably two of the most important and most famous heroes in ancient Greek culture. Uh, they were heroes of the Trojan War, which was written about uh, by uh, the author Homer. Now when Ezekias is painting this, and he's not the only one doing scenes of Achilles and Ajax, it's actually a, a really popular scene, uh, but when he's painting this, this is 600 years after the Trojan War. So Greeks are still talking about the events of the Trojan War and these heroes, Achilles and Ajax, 600 years later. Just to give us some sense of the depth of Greek history here. Um, so Ezekias is giving us these scenes uh, of these two heroes, known for their epic battles, their intense loyalty, their, uh, their great skill as military leaders and commanders and soldiers and warriors. Uh, and how does he present them to us? Not in the midst of combat, not preparing for war, not as heroic victors in the aftermath of war, 
uh, but as two men with their spears and their helmets and their shields sort of put aside taking a moment to play a simple dice game and so what we see are these two men these these heroes these epic heroes being presented in a way that is completely human imagine that for a moment and try to compare that to what we've seen in in other cultures representations of kings and heroic figures because it's rather unprecedented um, this idea that we would show these 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 amazing heroes uh, as just a couple of guys just a couple of guys there's gonna be a great big battle coming up uh, they're probably a little bit nervous you know a lot of men are going to die there are no guarantees in war um, so they have to wait before they can start to march out what are they gonna do let's sit down and play a game let's just do something to get our minds off of this battle to get our minds off of this war uh, and just sort of feel human for a little while. That is such an important aspect of Greek culture and Greek mythology. Uh, this is such a human moment uh, and is why I personally, this is just my personal taste, uh, but it's one of the reasons why I personally just adore this particular piece. Uh, you don't get to be bigger heroes in Greek mythology than Ajax and Achilles. Uh, and we're just representing them here as a couple of guys, a couple of soldiers just needing a little bit of downtime uh, before the next great battle. And like any great Greek story, um, there's a lot of tragedy uh, involved with Achilles and Ajax. If you've heard that word Achilles before, you've probably heard it associated with anatomy, the Achilles tendon, which we all have at the back of our ankle. Um, that is a term that we get from the ancient Greek story. Uh, Achilles was purportedly, when he was an infant, dunked into the river Styx by his mother, and the waters essentially protected him, blessed him in a certain way, which meant he, he was pretty much invincible because he had been dunked in the waters of the river Styx. Um, the waters covered every part of his body except the one part of his ankle that his mother held. Uh, to dip him into the water. That was his one weak spot, his, well, Achilles heel. Um, much later in his adulthood during the Tro Trojan War, he would in fact get hit by an arrow in that one spot, uh, which would eventually lead to his death. And his friend, Ajax, seen here playing this game with him, it would be his responsibility to go to the Trojans uh, and rescue uh, Achilles' body uh, so that he could be brought back home to Greece. It's a really great story. Um, and I'll mention a little bit more about Greek literature uh, because it's something else I'm quite a fan of. And it's honestly still very, very relevant, uh, I, I think, uh, today. You can get a lot of very poignant stories out of a lot of Greek literature um, that still resonate today. But anyway, I'll, I'll stop gushing over this piece. Um, it is, for me, my favorite piece that we'll probably look at this week. Not just because of its stunning beauty and the, the intricacy with which it's executed, but the very human story that it tells about these epic heroes, which relates to the gods and goddesses of Greece. Um, if you're familiar with these gods and goddesses, Zeus and Athena and Poseidon and so on, uh, they are, of course, supernatural beings with all of these great powers, but when you get right down to it, the gods and goddesses of ancient Greece are very human. They get angry, they get jealous, they have lust, they get greedy. Uh, they have a lot of the same emotions and reactions that regular human beings have. Um, and again, that's very uh, unique to Greek culture and will greatly influence how Greeks represent their gods and goddesses and how they relate to each other as human beings. So while Exekius' example of Ajax and Achilles playing dice is my personal favorite representation, it was by no means the only one. This was a very popular subject matter. Uh, and this is a great example uh, of this painter giving us two different versions of the scene on the same, on the same vessel, the same uh, amphora. 
So we can see on one side, on the left, we see the black figures, so done in the same technique as Ezekius did. And then on the right side, we see the uh, red figure, so it's a different technique where instead of coming in and painting in the figures with the black glaze, we're instead leaving the figures the natural color of the pot and then using the glaze for the outlines and the details. Um, it's just the, the opposite technique to create the figures. It gives you a different look to the figures overall. Um, again, these aren't small vessels. This one is a little over a foot tall. Um, as we look at these, we'll see many of the same features, many of the same details. Um, I think with this painter, especially if you compare the black figure on the left-hand side to Ezekius in the previous slide, um, Ezekius's figures tend to bend and move in a little bit more naturalistic of a fashion. They seem to be conversing with each other in a little bit more of an intimate space. I feel like these figures are a bit more stiff and a bit more rigid. And that's just another reason that I personally tend to favor Ezekius's example over this one. Not that there's anything wrong with this one. This is still beautifully done, very skillfully rendered. Um, and again, just an example of how pervasive the story was, how much this this side of these heroes uh, was enjoyed by the ancient Greeks. Uh, we see lots and lots of representations of them in this moment, as opposed to some sort of glorious uh, victory moment. So at this point, I'm just going to take a moment to mention one uh, great name of Greek literature to come out of this era, Sophocles. Uh, he's one. He's considered one of three ancient Greek trage tragedians, sorry, uh, whose plays have survived to us. Uh, there is a great difficulty, of course, with many of these plays that are thousands of years old. We only have them in fragments. Uh, it can be difficult to reconstruct them, but we do have some of Sophocles' works uh, in total. We know he wrote about 123 plays during the course of his life. We only have seven in complete form. Uh, and they include Ajax, whom we just talked about with uh, Achilles, uh, Antigone, uh, the women of Trachis, Oedipus the king, Electra, uh, Oedipus at Colonus. Uh, I'm hoping some of you are at least, you've at least heard of Oedipus Rex. Um, you have maybe are familiar with that, at least in passing, even if you haven't actually read the plays. Um, he's still very much recognized today for his intense uh, depictions of war. And so I did... I'm not going to spend a lot of time with Sophocles just because uh, this class is very much focused on the visual arts and not the literary arts. Um, if I can, I'm going to post a link uh, in this presentation of a YouTube clip. It's very, very, very short. Um, and I'll make it purely optional if you want to look at it or not. Uh, but I would encourage you to do so because Sophocles' plays, particularly Ajax, uh, still is so very important and is such, has such resonant themes of humanity and tragedy and war uh, and the crippling nature of trauma and war uh, that it's actually being used by the United States government to help warriors or modern day warriors to help our soldiers deal with post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, that's how intense Sophocles works are. Um, so if you have the chance, if you're so inclined, again, I'll make it perfectly optional. You're not going to get graded on it. I would encourage you, I'll try to put a link here uh, that you can click on. I encourage you to give this little news clip a watch. It's only uh, a few minutes long. It's not very long. Uh, just so you can get an appreciation of this literature. You might think that something that was written so many thousands of years ago would have nothing to do with your life today. Um, but Sophocles really keyed in on some essentially human things about emotion, our relationship to others, and uh, the effects of trauma on the human psyche. Uh, and his points were so poignant and so relevant that they're still with us today. We can still find a lot of relevance uh, to them today. So that's all I'll say on it. Um, otherwise, this lecture would be way, way too long. Um, so I encourage you to watch it. 
It's a very short clip, and maybe it might give you a little bit more appreciation on the literature that the Greeks who are creating this work, this is the stuff they're reading, and this, these are the plays they're going to see. This is a part of the culture that is producing this visual art. So I'll leave it at that, and we'll move on to some uh, more archaic sculpture. So I want to talk about the transition from archaic into classical. And to do that, we'll look at the pediment sculpture uh, of this t uh, temple, the Temple of Ephaea, uh, originally from Agena, Greece, uh, done about 500 to 490 BCE. Um, at the very center, the center figure you're seeing in this arrangement is about 5 foot 8 at the center, carved out of marble. Now these are no longer in their uh, location in Greece, as you can see on the slide. This is cur currently in Munich, Germany. Uh, the original temple was destroyed in ancient times. We think that the original temple might have been destroyed by the Persians, actually, uh, sometime around 490 or so uh, BCE. Um, so currently, they have been relocated to Munich, where they're on display. We're going to take a couple look uh, at some of these figures, and we're going to notice uh, what's great about this temple is that it really documents this change for us from the archaic to the classical. This is our center figure from this pediment arrangement, uh, and this is the goddess Athena. So here we're actually looking at a goddess figure. Um, you'll notice some odd things about her, some of these holes that looks like that are in the marble. We do know that some of those holes were there because she originally had metal attached to her. So in the front, uh, by her breasts, you notice two holes there. We believe that she had a metal breastplate that would have come over her front, that actually would have attached to the front of her. Uh, her helmet most likely also actually had metal pieces on it, which is accounting for some of the, the holes we see there. Those pieces have been lost to antiquity. Um, so we do have to imagine that we're not seeing the complete piece with Athena here. I'll just point out on her face, we're seeing those big open eyes and that little archaic smile. No matter how awkward it looks, there it is. Uh, to, to give us that symbol that this is an archaic piece showing liveliness and vitality. Her overall stance, her overall, the way her arms are and so on, a little bit stiff, but not not too abstracted. We can very clearly see that this is a human-esque figure. She's a goddess. She's not human. But she has the body of a human that we can read very easily. Um, so not too different from other archaic representations that we've seen. So let's take a look at another example from the same pediment. So this is from that same pediment arrangement. And here, on one far end of the pediment, at the far end of that triangular structure, uh, we see this guy, a dying warrior. And we're seeing some awkward things with this dying warrior. Um, we notice that he's sort of very frontal to us. And just look at the way he's balanced on his hip and on his arm in a way that doesn't really seem to be very naturalistic at all. We do have a lot of great attention to the musculature, the torso, and the arms. So there, clearly this is an artist that can do realistic work, that is aware of how to create naturalistic detail. Uh, I particularly like the look of the stretching skin on the arm that's underneath him. Um, but then that face, there we go with that face, that, that odd archaic smile, the big open eyes. Uh, and then just the overall pose of the piece is extremely awkward uh, looking to us. That thing that his hand is grabbing there, we believe that originally uh, that was an arrow or a spear that was sticking out of his chest. So he is dying. He has been uh, mortally wounded and he's about to die. Not that you could really tell by looking at his face. So I want you to keep these characteristics in your mind. That archaic face with the smile this awkward, not quite natural pose that he's, that he's positioned in. So even though we have some really nice, realistic musculature, there's still a lot about this that just makes it look very static and artificial. And let's compare it to the same, some statues on the same building, but on the, diff, on the other side. 
This is also a dying warrior, and he's from the same building, but he's from the east pediment, the east side of the building, whereas the guy we just looked at was from the west side. Um, now, I hope you're seeing immediately some pretty remarkable differences between these two. This comes to us about the year 480 BCE. Uh, and while the previous statue we looked at was very much rooted in that archaic tradition, this guy is going to be the early part of what we'll consider the classical tradition. So we're seeing this change in style within just a few decades of each other, uh, this evolution in style. Uh, so this guy, and I encourage you to just take a moment to look at him and jot down a few ideas on how he is different from his predecessor. Um, we're going to notice, first off, a little bit more naturalism in his pose. I'm not going to say it's completely anatomically accurate to how a body would lay on the ground, but we're seeing a little bit more attempt here to show the weight of the body, uh, to show him moving. We see a twisting of the torso. Um, and again, just like the last one, I do like the arm, the support arm on the last one, but this one we see a lot more... Uh, a lot more emphasis. Look at that shield arm. Um, he's got his arm attached to his shield. We really get the sense that there is weight being borne by that arm. He's trying to pull himself up. He's trying to push himself up, but he too has been mortally wounded. Uh, and this is his last breath, essentially. Um, his face, we get a little bit less of that odd smile and a little bit more of uh, like a grimace. Uh, the eyes, they're still very stylized. They're not natural-looking eyes. But we're no longer so obsessed with turning them outward uh, and having those completely frontal-looking eyes. We actually get the sense that these are facing in a bit more of a natural direction. All of this is leading up to what we'll consider a high classical approach to the human body, where we're going to treat the human body like it has mass, like it has weight, like it moves naturally in three-dimensional space. Uh, and Greek artists are going to become increasingly interested in that, which we'll see in our next piece. So this is going to really exemplify what we talk about when we mean the classical era of Greek sculpture. This is the Critios boy. Uh, he was originally from the Acropolis. He's not a tall piece. He's a little under three feet tall, carved out of marble. Uh, but take a good look at this. Um, there are some parts that have been broken, but we can still see the overall body pretty well. What we're going to notice with Critios boy uh, is not just the super refined attention to the body, uh, the super smooth nature of the skin, uh, the way it pulls and undulates over the muscle, and we actually get a sense, like in the, the previous piece we saw, that this, this isn't just a chunk of rock. This is skin over muscle and vein. Uh, we're really getting that sense of a body here. I also want to draw your attention to, to the way he's standing, and I'll try to make these gestures on the slide if I can. Um, the angle of his shoulders versus the angle of his hips and how they relate to the way that he's stepping. He would have been striding forward in the way that we saw before. Uh, and we're going to notice whenever we see that, and it's kind of subtle in this piece, is this S-curve of the body, this S-curve of the spine, uh, which is a natural part of human locomotion. Just pay attention to your own body as you walk. As you take one step or another, or if you stop and just uh, stand on one foot and then shift over and stand on the other foot, there's a whole lot of mechanical processes that have to go on uh, in order for your body to do that. There's this constant counterbalance that has to be done um, as you shift your center of gravity from one leg to another, as you swing your legs, uh, as you move your hips to take a step. Um, your spine, your torso, your arms, your legs, all of these muscles are moving in coordination with each other. Greek artists are paying attention to that. They're observing real people and real muscles. Uh, they're observing motion and anatomy in an attempt to try to capture that in marble or bronze or whatever the case may be. They want to create images that are as close to lifelike being full of life as they possibly can. And the apex of that is probably here with this classical moment uh, and things like the Critios boy. 
uh, where we get an absolutely realistic depiction of a human body. We notice that the archaic smile is gone. Um, the eyes most likely were originally inlaid with, with some other material. That's why they look hollow to us now. Uh, but they're not the big stylized staring eyes that we've become so accustomed to. They actually look like real eyes. The ears look like human ears. All of this attention being paid to detail. Um, really an important part of Greek culture, religion, and so on. Let's take another look at this guy. Here's another view of Critios boy, so we're seeing him from the, s the side here. Uh, where again, uh, you can just see how much this looks like a real body. This actually looks like skin on muscle as opposed to just rock that's been carved. Um, and this tremendous attention to detail. Now, it's important to understand about Greek uh, mythology and uh, Greek religion is that the gods and goddesses, in addition to behaving uh, like humans sometimes, uh, with all of our, our nastier uh, traits sometimes, uh, they could also, gods could also take human form. Uh, and it was quite possible for the gods and goddess, uh, goddesses of Olympus to walk around on earth in human form. So the Greeks had a very interesting concept of the body, uh, where this idea that this person you, en you encounter on the road, this person you interact with uh, in a marketplace, could in fact be a god or goddess in disguise, walking around as a human being. So we get a, a sort of preoccupation with the physical body, uh, and very much this idea in ancient Greece that beautiful, per perfect bodies, like what we see with Critios boy here, uh, perfect bodies are representations of a perfect character, and by extension, a perfect soul. To look good was to be a good person in ancient Greece. Um, and so we get this, this really uh, interesting combination of body politics with religion, uh, with ancient Greek representations. Uh, Critios boy is sometimes referred to uh, by some scholars as the apex of realism in ancient Greece. And uh, we'll want to consider that further as we look at a couple of different examples. If our two-foot-tall Critios boy is the apex of realism in ancient Greek statue, then how do we want to consider this? This warrior was found off of the coast of Italy in Reace, uh, so he's sometimes referred to as the Reace warrior. Uh, he is cast bronze six foot six, uh, and that just always boggles my mind that he's made out of cast bronze and he's six foot six. That that is a lot of bronze, guys. Um, take a good look at him. He was made using the lost wax casting process, which your book talks about. I won't go into detail here. Um, you may be tempted to look at this piece, this amazing piece, and think that, well, certainly this must be, in fact, the apex of realism in classical Greek art. Uh, I mean, it's a much larger piece. It's a, it's a very sophisticated uh, means of making a, a visual piece. And the detail on this piece is is even greater than Critios boy. Um, if we look at the musculature, uh, if you could zoom in on the hands, I, I don't know how well you can see it on YouTube here, um, the hands are complete in terms that you can see uh, the creases around the hands, the knuckles, uh, the you can see the fingernails, uh, the beard has a really great texture to it. There's copper inlay on the lips and the eyelids and the nipples to give them uh, a separation of color, a modulation of color. Uh, the feet that he's standing on are not just flat on the bottom, they're completely molded. So if you tipped him over and looked at the bottom of the feet, they would look like the bottom of an actual foot. Uh, the detail on this thing is outstanding. Uh, they're incredibly impressive pieces. And I say pieces because there's two of these guys. We're just looking at the one. Um, <clears throat> you'll notice the way he's standing. He did originally have a shield and a spear. Uh, that would have attached to him, and I think he also had a helmet that would have been sitting on top of his head uh, that is not in this picture. Um, as we notice 
how this guy is standing, we're also going to see that S-curve, that sway of the shoulders and the hips, which is called contrapposto, uh, how we see the shifting weight of a body standing in three-dimensional space. Uh, and certainly this looks, at first set, an incredibly realistic, natural-looking human figure. But if you look a little bit closer, you're going to see that it's really not. Uh, if you look at the, the dividing line, uh, but on the muscle from the hip to the torso. That's an incredibly crisp line. I don't care how many crunches you do at the gym. Uh, the human body is not going to look like that. You're never going to get that crest of muscle right there. It's not natural. Uh, the breastbone, the crevice of the breastbone going down uh, his his chest uh, is, is far too deep to be naturalistic. Uh, all of the muscles, you'll notice all of the attenuation of the muscles, even the muscles that should be relaxed because his arm is hanging down, uh, the muscles are tense. Uh, you know, as we start to look at this, we'll notice that his legs are a little too long uh, for the average length of a leg. Uh, things have been distorted, moved around, distorted, exaggerated in this piece. It's not naturalistic. It's not realistic the way that Critios boy was, the way that previous piece was. Um, it seems, and there are lots and lots of scholars who have pointed this out, uh, that as soon as classical Greeks figure out how to represent a perfectly natural, realistic representation of a human being, they almost immediately stop doing that and start creating these kinds of exaggerations. They go for these more human than human uh, figures uh, that are impossibly muscled and stand in these impossible ways. Uh, they immediately go for the exaggeration. Um, now there's lots of fascinating theories on why that is. Uh, I can't possibly go into them all here. Um, but it's, it's a really interesting look into Greek culture where it seems they've been building and building and building towards trying to create ultimately realistic pieces. They finally achieve that with pieces like Critios Boy and then they almost immediately stop doing that and just keep going towards this abstraction and exaggeration. We see it here with this Riace warrior and we'll see it uh, in this next piece as well. This is a figure of a god. We figured that it was either Zeus or Poseidon. Not entirely sure which god it was supposed to be. Um, he is six foot ten, cast bronze. Again, it's just sort of mind-boggling that they're able to create these these pieces on this scale. Um, he was created somewhere about 460 to 450 BCE. Um, again, found off of the the coast of Greece. Um, he's got a lot of the same issues that we saw with the Riace warrior. His musculature is ex exquisitely rendered, but it's over-exaggerated. Um, his arms are a little too long. Uh, they're sort of lengthened for dramatic effect to make him look bigger and more intimidating. I guess being six foot ten wasn't intimidating enough for our artists here. Um, but joking aside, it's a, a beautiful piece and an amazing, uh, an amazing piece, but it's an exaggerated piece of, of the human form. It's not naturalistic. It's not realistic. Um, and so that's something that we're going to have to negotiate as we move through the classical era. This is still considered classical, uh, and we'll see examples of classical Greek art that have this kind of abstraction and exaggeration to them. That's going to be different from the Hellenistic period, which sort of takes this in a different direction, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. So again, this is uh, just part one of a two-part lecture. Um, I'll try not to make every lecture two parts long, but we will have that occasionally. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to put the link here uh, for you to go on to part two and pick it up there. So I'll, I'll talk at you over there.